Greetings, dear listeners, and welcome to 1812 Channel. This month's book, okay, it was supposed to be the September book, but I'm more than a little behind in my work here. This month's book is The War of 1812 in the Age of Napoleon by Jeremy Black. So, who's Jeremy Black? He's a professor emeritus from the History Department of the University of Exeter, UK, and the author of more than 180 books, most on military history. And, amazingly enough, we share a birthday, October 30th, 1955. So, what's the, what's the current score? Jeremy Black, 180. Warren James, well, I might write a book someday, maybe, maybe, but I digress. So, this book might be considered unusual, as it provides a British and international, not American or Canadian, perspective on the war. I was pleased when I saw the title, as I always thought of the War of 1812 as a byproduct of the Napoleonic Wars, even though I was confused as to why Tchaikovsky wrote an overture about the War of 1812. Throughout the age of Napoleon, Jeremy Black links the events of the war to the international political situation and to the Napoleonic Wars and other conflicts involving Great Britain. And, and reading this, I realized how little I knew about military history prior to the American Civil War, although I'd always considered myself well-versed. Black states his purpose in writing Thus, quote, The central theme of this book has been an attempt to locate the War of 1812 in its international context, diplomatic, military, and economic. End of quote. For Black, fire and water are the enduring images, perhaps you could say enduring elements, of the War of 1812. It's a good pairing, too, as it encapsulates both the burning of Washington and York, present-day Toronto, and the naval clashes on the Great Lakes and along the Atlantic. Black notes that while the War of 1812 was responsible for a number of American national memories and symbols, a. the defense of Baltimore and the victory at New Orleans, b. Oliver Hazard Perry's victory over a British squadron on Lake Erie, and C, the National Anthem, the Star-Spangled Banner, which describes the defense of Baltimore, to which I might add D, the famous battle cry, Don't Give Up the Ship, uttered by a dying Captain James Lawrence of the USS Chesapeake during an engagement with HMS Shannon. Unfortunately, the crew did indeed give up the ship. In spite of all this, Black writes that most Americans know little, if anything, about the War of 1812. In his introduction, Black says the age of Napoleon will discuss a. the reasons for the repeated American military failures, b. the American political divisions regarding the war, and C, the fate of the Native Americans slash First Nations as a result of the war. Black notes the real importance of the War of 1812 to North American history. Differing results could have resulted in sections of Canada being part of the United States and vice versa. He also suggests that the conflict is instructive in pointing out the limitations of expeditionary warfare which I think we're seeing today in real time. Think Ukraine. Black believes that the early Americans had a suspicion of the military, of a standing army, a skepticism they inherited from their English forebears. As a result, they had no army capable of offensive action or a navy capable of engaging the greatest navy in the world, Great Britain's Royal Navy. In addition to this suspicion of standing armies, 
The Americans felt a degree of paranoia with regards to British intentions, whilst the British were primarily concerned with Napoleon. Following the introduction, in the chapter entitled Paths to War, Black outlines the various trade disputes between Great Britain and the United States, which would eventually include the Orders in Council and Impressment, as well as other conflicts over relations with Native Americans and the slave trade. American legislation with regards to Britain, quote, was primarily designed to ensure a change in British policy without going to war, end of quote, as well as, quote, force American economic and sectional interests to heed the wishes of the federal government, end of quote, the wishes of the federal government, <laughs> which in 1812 was certainly not the powerful centralized force it is today. And when legislation didn't work, war! Thus, the USA blundered into a war that large parts of the country, i.e. New England, didn't support and which England didn't want. As a side note, quote, in an ahistorical moment, Richard Glover, a Canadian historian, compared the USA in 1812 to Mussolini's Italy, which, in 1940, joined Hitler's Germany against Britain when the later was weak and vulnerable, as it had been in the face of Napoleonic power in 1812. End of quote. I'm not sure that analogy quite fits, but I'm going to see if I can find the article, and if so, I'll make a short video about it. The article, by the way, is called The French Fleet, Britain's Problem and Madison's Opportunity, and it appeared in the Journal of Modern History back in 1967. The body of the age of Napoleon, like most books about the War of 1812, goes through the conflict year by year. I especially like Black's title for the chapter covering the events of 1814, The Empire Strikes Back. But Black also has a chapter on the war at sea, an aspect of the conflict that is often overlooked, but, as he points out, Despite some notable successes in individual engagements, the Americans were unable to build on their maritime victories and were eventually penned in and hemmed in by the might of the British Royal Navy. In his chapter on consequences, which covers the peace treaty, the Treaty of Ghent, Black concludes that, after defeating their existential enemy, Napoleon, the British were tired of war and were ready to return to the status quo that existed before the war. And the Americans, who were not only tired of fighting, but were also broke, were only too happy to accept. Quote, the Americans learned in 1812-14 that Canada could not be conquered because of poor leadership political decentralization, logistical problems, environmental factors, and the strength of the resistance, the USA was unable to launch a successful offensive against Canada. The realization that Canada could not be conquered greatly eased subsequent relations with Britain. End of quote. In his last chapter, Conclusions, Black states that one of the most interesting aspects of Anglo-American relations between 1783 and 1945 was the fact that, with the exception of the War of 1812, there was rivalry, but not conflict. The results have been over 200 years of peace and cooperation between the three countries, Great Britain, the United States, and Canada, which, 
and this is my own comment, not Jeremy Black's, culminated in the D-Day landings of June the 6th, 1944, when there were two American beaches, two British beaches, but also a Canadian beach, Juneau Beach. Canada, America, and Great Britain fighting side by side. Jeremy Black's The War of 1812 in the Age of Napoleon is dense with information, and I feel my review hardly does it justice. My rating is 4.25 out of 5, and I encourage you all to read it for a British and international perspective on the War of 1812. Have a suggestion for a War of 1812 book for us to read? Then please share it in the comments below. Our next book will be A Brilliant Affair, The Battle of Queenston Heights, 1812, by Robert Malcolmson. It will also serve as my review of the battle. Please drop a like if you enjoyed the video, and please consider subscribing to our channel where we chronicle and discuss the events of the War of 1812. My current goal is 100 subscribers. Won't you help me achieve it? When the barrage lifts, cheers! And a big P.S. I must apologize for the poor quality of my vocal presentation today, but as you can probably tell, I'm fighting a rather bad cold. However, I had studio time booked, and... I believe in the actor's code. The show must go on. Thank you for listening. Cheers.